So we're happy to be part of the Farming Smarter Field School. Um, I also want to introduce Amy and Holly, who work in the Lethbridge Lab. They are seed analysts and also training as crop inspectors. So that's one of our other gigs is we're licensed seed crop inspectors for hybrid canola. So we spend a lot of time, or I spend a lot of time down here. Um, they're here permanently. So welcome to our plots. Um, what we're looking at in the plots here today is we've got three different crops. So right behind me, I've got some wheat. And then you guys are all astute farmers and agronomists and already knew that before I even said that. And behind that is barley. And then way back there is some peas just before that windbreak. So we'll be able to huddle into that windbreak near the end because Holly and Amy are gonna show us some of the seeds that were planted into the pots and also some of the actual lab blotters that we use in the lab to determine seed quality. So for those of you who don't know what 2020 does, we're a seed quality laboratory and we are accredited by the CFIA. Does anyone know what accredited by the CFIA means? Means our black key. Means our black key on whatever you decide on. So the answer was they'll back us. Well, I guess sort of they'll back us. They do have uh, their own laboratory in Saskatoon. So their role is more of a a governing body to ensure uniformity amongst accredited laboratories in Canada. So there's only a few tests that we actually do that are accredited and our laboratory does a, hundreds of different tests for seed quality. Um, there's only a few tests that we do that are actually accredited. That means they're monitored by CFIA and they ensure consistency from lab to lab. Those tests are required for certifying seed. So everybody knows what the blue tag is on a bag of seeds and it has a grade on it. It could be cert one or cert two or common. Does anyone know what actually determines the grade on a bag of seed? Shout it out. Germination. Germination. Anything else? Weed content. Weed contents, yeah. So that's a purity, right? Weeds or other things like sclerotia, depending on the crop, ergot. We're looking for other things that could affect your seed quality or your crop ultimately. So those are two things. There's also smut on barley that we look for specifically, and that's about it. Every other test that we do is not accredited, or any other test that any other lab does, it's not accredited. So it's strictly on the merits of the lab and how they perform those tests is that what results you get. So with um, germination and purity, those are the basic tests that specify the grade. Um, we do those tests obviously in the lab under controlled conditions. Does anyone know what temperature we would test seed at for germination? 10 degrees. 12. 12. Getting warmer. 21, absolutely. Um, 21 degrees. How many people plant their barley at 21 degrees soil temp? Nobody, right? Well, we did because we planted all these plots June 10th. So the reason why we planted June 10th is I wanted you guys to see seedlings right? I don't want you to see plants the size of that winter wheat. So we want to look at seedlings, what's happening. So it puts us at a bit of a disadvantage, I guess an advantage and a disadvantage planting June 10th. Can someone say what's an advantage of planting June 10th other than soil temp was nice and warm? Yeah, so the air temp is warmer. And what does warmer soil temp usually equate to? Good emergence, right? And why would we get good emergence? Less stress on the seed, right? Less temperature stress and maybe less disease pressure too. So those are really important factors. Nobody has the luxury of planting their seed at 21 degrees Celsius. Or we're never gonna, this isn't gonna amount to anything if we took it to yield. So what other tests can you do on your cereal or your pulses or your canola that's gonna give you more information than germ? Vigor. Absolutely. How many people have ever done a vigor test on their seed lot? So lots of hands. It's becoming more and more popular. And if you were to only do one test, you would do a vigor test. Germination is great for applying a grade to your seed because it's a nice standard test that we can do under ideal conditions. And we could test the maximum potential of your seed. If we seeded it all on June 10th, we'd probably get a decent stand, but nobody does that. So vigor is really going to separate the men from the boys, if you want to use a cliche, right? So that's what the vigor test is going to do. 
Um, vigor tests, we do many different vigor tests. Our lab is internationally accredited as well. We're the only lab in Canada that's internationally accredited. So there actually are some vigor tests that are accredited through the ISTA, International Seed Testing Association. We do some of those on soybeans and canola, but there's nothing on cereals. So we have tests that we use in the lab for cereals that we've developed over the years that we think correlate really well and provide you guys as producers or agronomists with really good information that you can use under our prairie conditions. So they're done for cereals, cold temperatures, five or six degrees. For soybeans, we do high temp, low temp, same with canola. Lots of different vigor tests for canola to put it through its paces. So in these trials here that you're looking at, we've got the three crops. But we've also got some seed that's, you can just see by the signs, low vigor, high vigor. We've got some disease seedlings. Um, same thing in the barley and the peas. We've got some mechanically damaged seed. How many people grow peas here? Got some peas, absolutely. Very important crop. This zone here in Alberta is the number one pea producer, right? So I'm, I'm, I sit on the Alberta Pulse Growers Research Committee. This is an important region for peas, absolutely. One thing we see in the lab when we test pea seed is lots of mechanical damage coming from the south. It diminishes as we go north and it diminishes if it's a seed producer versus a grower that's growing to save seed for himself. So does anybody know why we get so much mechanical damage in the south? Dry conditions. Combining too fast, you guys in a hurry? Yeah. So absolutely, you can mitigate the damage with mechanically damaged seed or mitigate the mechanical damage by slowing down. Augers you mentioned, yeah, if you talk to a pea grower, someone like Galloway seeds up way up in Edmonton, lots of belts, right? Move everything really carefully. Don't damage that seed. So really important. So there's things you can do. We'll, let, we'll take a look at that. I'm going to ask for a couple of volunteers because you don't just get to stand around there and get blown around in the wind. So a couple counters. We're going to count some of these seedlings here. So let's start, Amy. Actually, we're going to go do the barley. Are we going to move along? Sure. Is that going to inconvenience our cameraman? <laughs> we're going to move. Yesterday we did wheat. Okay. Today we're going to do barley. And the surprising thing is, and keep in mind, this is a demo, and we're not, we're not marketing any seed treatments here or anything. So we are an independent laboratory. We work for the producers. We work for the seed companies. We don't buy and sell any seed. We have nothing invested in seed per se. So we're an independent voice. So we just chose some actual real life samples from producers, put them into the ground with a few different conditions that we see commonly. And the interesting thing is we all, we just worked through the wheat plots yesterday. The barley is actually coming out virtually identical. So it's really interesting to see. So today we're going to just walk up one plot up and we'll do some counting in the barley. So whoever I hand these uh, meter sticks to, there's a little black line at the bottom. That's where the meter ends. So don't get overzealous and count the whole stake. But we're going to count a meter of row. And let's go up to the barley. Where do we want to start, Amy? Are we going to start on that side of the barley? Does it really matter? Okay. So that's the, that's the good germ and good vigor barley. Let's just move up to that plot and we'll get a couple of volunteers. So while I'm talking, I'm gonna ask you please, to count the good germ, good vigor. Just take a row and count one meter. We're not gonna do this real scientific and do four reps or anything. You sir, there's the line right there, the meter line. Just do the next plot. So while they're counting, you can see we threw one more element in here just to mix things up. We threw a seed treatment in. And I didn't want to get into any treatment wars and start trying to decide what seed treatment's better than the other. So for cereals, we just, everything's Roxel Pro Shield. That's it. Put that in. If you really want to know, for the pulses, we just did Apron Max on the peas, treated, untreated. So we threw one seed treatment in just to add a little element to it. So we got good germ and good vigor. And on that barley, the germ is 99%. That's pretty good. We're just shy of percent. The vigor is 98%. So very high vigorous, high vigor seed. Um, so what do we do? Is there any difference between, let's see, let's go with the untreated. What do we get for a meter of row? 31. 31 seedlings emerged. 
and the seeding rate was 300 uh, seeds per meter squared. Is that what it was? So if we convert the 31, it's multiplied by four and divide by 300. So we're at about mm, 124, right? Is that right? 30, 60, yeah, 124 out of 300 seeds. Okay, so we're at about 30 some percent emergence. We lost 66%. And that's seeding under pretty decent conditions. How do we do with the tree? Did any difference? 42, so a little bit of a difference. Did everybody attend uh, Murray Hartman's talk where he talked all about statistics? So who knows if that's statistically valid? Not unless they do four reps and keep counting for a little while longer. But there's a difference. Maybe valid, maybe not. How about if we get a couple other people? We want to add some experimental error here and get two other counters, or do we want to keep the same guys? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Let's add some experimental error. So we'll count the two poor vigor. Now the poor vigor was actually 50%, 56% vigor. Uh, the germination on that one. We don't have the germ on that one. Okay. Generally, what we see is you may have a seed lot that has a pretty decent germ that's still making cert one, but it can have low vigor. So we can have seed lots with high germ and high vigor, and we can have seed lots with high germ and low vigor. And worst case scenario is you got low germ and low vigor, and there's not much you can do. You can protect a seed lot that has high germ and low vigor a couple different ways, right? So you can add some insurance. One is you could seed at June 10th, or you could seed it last, so you give it sort of the least amount of stress. And in other ways, you could put a seed treatment on it. And the most important point I want to get across today is that you as a producer or a consultant really need to know what the issues are with your seed if you're going to make management decisions. Because there's the one big black box that we can't really deal with is the weather. What's going to happen after we plant? We know the soil conditions and the soil temp when we plant. So the more you know about the seed, the better. So the germ is okay. Vigor is really important. And then we're going to talk about disease. So how do we do on the low vigor seed lot? 33. 33. Actually pretty decent. How about with the treatment? Did it help? Didn't help. Did it go 19? It actually went down. Wow. Did it go down? Who knows? Right? So statistically, maybe we could do that again. Maybe we could turn it around. If I'm trying to sell that treatment or not sell the treatment, maybe we could turn it around. But my point is, we don't really have a difference here between the high vigor and the low vigor if we look just at those four counts because we planted it June 10th. So it was good to know that we had high vigor and low vigor and it helped us make a management decision because that would have been one more kind of black box that I had no clue if I just did a germ on that sample. So lastly, I want to talk about disease. Has anyone tested their seed for disease? You have, sir, and you have. So did you use us, hopefully? Yes. Awesome. Good man. I didn't pay you, did I? <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Good. So yeah, we have a test called the fungal screen. So we can tell you what's on the seed for seed-borne pathogens. And you can use that as just another management tool to help you decide if you're going to even use that seed lot. What is one pathogen on the seed that's probably going to make you decide not to use that seed lot if you're living in Alberta? Right, so Fusarium graminiarum, right? If we have Fusarium graminiarum, we're probably not going to use that seed lot. You could use it if it was harvested on your farm. You could plant it on your farm again if you so wanted, but you cannot sell that seed in Alberta, not legally anyway. Oh, Amy's just handing out some info on the fungal screen for you. Um, this particular seed, actually, can we get two more counters? And while I'm talking, we'll get two more counters to do the last two barley plots. Okay. Awesome. So while they're counting, this barley seed here, the diseased, and you guys can go ahead and count if you want. We can huddle on over here if everybody wants to. 
You're obviously not with Bayer Crop Science then. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's unbiased count. <laughs> so how are things, Doug? Yeah, good. good, good. Good to see you. You're escaping the cold in Chile? Welcome back to Canada. <laughs> good. So we have a guest here all the way from Chile that came just to see our plots. So thanks for coming, Doug. He just wanted to get out of the winter time and come back to the Lethbridge wind. So we've done the fungal screen on these disease samples and we're looking for a couple different things on the seed. We're looking at a few different storage organisms and that's really important if you do the fungal screen after harvest, right off the combine. So in this particular sample at 14% Altenaria, which isn't too much of an issue as far as the pathogen's concerned. That and Aspergillus. Um, Cladosporium, Epicoccum, some of those pathogens, well they're not pathogens, they're more just storage organisms. They're, are, they are what's going to contribute to heating in the bin, right? So the high levels of those organisms, usually you pick it up in the swath. Everybody straight cuts right down south? Yeah, we don't really have that luxury in Edmonton where I'm from. A lot of crops lay in the swath for a while and then they get wet and they pick up all these other organisms, especially bad on barley with the hulls. So you get a lot of issues. So that can contribute to heating in the bin if it's going in wet. The big thing on this seed though was common root rot. And that's Cochleobulus sativus. It was 77% infested with common root rot. So three quarters of the seeds had high levels of common root rot. Holly and Amy will show you some of the Petri dishes, what we use in the lab to ID those, those uh, pathogens. So that's a, a pathogen by the name common root rot. It's seed borne, it's soil borne, it's stubble borne. It's all over the place. And if you lay your grain down in a swath and you get some wet, cool weather, the spores are all over that seed. So now you got an issue possibly in the spring. So it also had a bit of fusarium on it. It had fusarium species, um, just 1.6%. Didn't have any fusarium head blight, luckily. And it's got nothing else on it. So the big one was the common root rot. So what happened when we planted it? And keep in mind, we planted it in pretty ideal conditions here, June 10th. So what was the count here? 12. 12. It's planted at the same seeding rate as these. So we definitely got a decrease right there, probably just from the common root rot, but also was the germ on that seed. Actually, the germ was 90%. So it was good, decent seed, right? It would have made cert number one. And did you guys know that we could still sell this seed as cert one and we don't have to tell you if i was a seed guy we don't have to tell you that it's got common root rot on it right because that's not part of the canadian grade standards so you sell your seed on germ and, and purity not on these seed borne pathogens so that's still certified number one seed that can be sold um, um but the seed grower is not obligated by law to do that but I know there are a lot of seed growers that do that over and above, but um, what the seed grower would probably do, the responsible seed grower, is they'd probably treat that seed and sell it to you treated. And how would it turn out if he treated it and sold it to you? 29. 29, and you had 12. 12. So almost three times the plant stand. So if the seed grower did that, that was really good. <laughs> yeah, so if the seed grower did that, you would never have an issue and there'd be no problem in your field. But if it was your own seed and you didn't know that it had that much common root rot, you potentially could run into a problem. So we're not saying you have to treat every seed lot. We're saying if you understand the quality of your seed, you can make those management decisions and decide whether or not you treat it. Because we had a producer yesterday ask about that. And he said, yeah, especially if I'm seeding later, not as late as June 10th, but he's watching the weather, soil's good. He's got high vigor, high germ. He might not go in with a treatment on that. He knows the history of his field because that's the black box too. What's in the soil? What's the soil borne pathogens? We can't do too much about that. So we're, we're going to hopefully put in high quality seed and we're going to overcome that one unknown. So that's just one thing. Um, are there any questions on the cereals before we go look at the peas? 
Absolutely, they can't sell you seed that's got Fusarium. The Fusarium on this is what we call just Fusarium species. So there's a whole bunch of other Fusarium species. Um, there's Fusarium avanaceum, there's Fusarium comorum. They all cause seedling issues, they all cause seedling blight. But in Alberta, we're really concerned about Fusarium graminearum. That's a really aggressive Fusarium species, causes lots of problems. Anybody from Manitoba? Doug is. Yeah, you know all about, are you, are you still farming in Manitoba right now, or, okay. So you know all about Fusarium. It's devastating. Um, it's an issue down south now, and it certainly causes problems between seed growers, between the north and the south, and that's definitely a concern. I sit on the Fusarium Action Committee as well, so that's, that's so always a big issue. Doug? Pardon me? It's migrated into Alberta? For yeah, yeah, it's been in Alberta for quite a few years now. So we struck up the Action Committee in about 2001 or so, somewhere in there. So and the, the, the action plan right now in Alberta still is all seed has to be tested. So seed cleaning plants test for Fusarium as well, um, or they all should. And um, we can't sell seed that has Fusarium graminearum on it. Okay. Well, they won't clean it if they're not disposed to. Yeah, yeah. We got to test it first. They won't clean it if they're not an What plant do you clean at? Lethbridge? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that's the policy of the whole Alberta Seed Cleaning Plant Association is that they test all the seed for Fusarium to try to limit the movement, right? Because it's, it's all farm safe seed going through those seed cleaning plants primarily. There's a lot of seed growers that use it too, but yeah lots so so fusarium's an issue definitely be cognizant about that um today i don't know if uh anybody talked to you about club root murray hartman talked about club root this morning he had some interesting plots but always keep club root on your mind so i'm going to bring that up even though we don't have it in the plot i know albert agriculture and brooks is putting on a really good club root called uh what is it Canola Gala or Gala, Club Root Gala. Anyway, they're going to start advertising that. It's going to be at the end of July in the Brooks area. Make sure you go to that. We're really lucky here in the south because of the good rotations with canola. Kept Club Root at bay, so we need to keep that up. Mostly because there's so much hybrid canola seed growing here and we have to have long rotations. Where I'm from, it's canola on canola all the time and we're Club Root Central. And these boots never leave Lethbridge. <laughs> so. Let's um, take a look at these peas. Can we get four new counters? We're going to add to our experimental error again. And four new counters. We could just count all four of these plots at once and I'll talk to you. Here we go. Holly will randomly pick four counters then. Oh, here we got a volunteer. Awesome. Good, good. So we did a little bit of um, overzealous digging yesterday to the counters. Be careful you don't count in a spot where we dug the plants out. And remember the line on your little meter stick. Remember the line. Good. Okay. Awesome. We got four counters busy here. So with the peas, we really did, we really want to focus on mechanical damage because that's such a big issue down south. Um, we threw the treatment in just for fun. But um, can anyone else tell me what can cause, I guess, abnormal seedlings other than mechanical damage on your cereals or peas? Glyphosate. Glyphosate, absolutely. And you didn't pay me, Stephanie. Did not pay you, sir. <laughs> um, why would we use glyphosate, right? Pre-harvest? Now, we shouldn't be using it if you're saving it for seed. Um, it can definitely cause issues, the chemical damage. Um, what happens is it shuts the seed down as it's maturing. So if you have some patches in your field that aren't quite mature, those are going to be all abnormal after you spray. Uh, glyphosate's worse on barley because the hull stays with the seed. Not as big of an issue on wheat. So if you ever do spray a pre-harvest and you want to use that for seed, make sure you label on the sample bag that you have used the pre-harvest. Then the analysts will take extra care when they're looking, look for abnormals. Because we'll show you what happens when you get an abnormal from mechanical damage. And chemical damage is not really that much different when you look at a seedling. So it's going to affect your plant stand. So we've got good germination for the peas. And that is 99% as well. 
Everybody's afraid to give him 100, I think, here. <laughs> so we give him a 99. And how did we do on the counts for that one? 20, Doug said. So the peas we had to seed a bit thinner. They're only at 80 seeds per square meter because we we're really limited on our seed lot because I said these are all actual farmer samples so we didn't mock anything up. Um, so 80 seeds, so we multiply that times four, 320, and we're supposed to divide. That doesn't make any sense at all. We wouldn't divide into, we're gonna go into eight. <laughs> what was it? 20. 20, yeah, times four. Okay, there we go, 80. Is that like 100%? Right. We got 80, and then we're supposed to, yeah, like we got 100% emergent. Wow, good job. So according to Doug, all of the seeds that we planted emerged. And actually yesterday we were getting around 80 some percent emergence based on the count. So Ken, who planted these plots said, he was really happy just with the way it went in. I'd be happy too if you're getting 85% of your seeds actually emerging, 99% germ. So it was good seed going into the ground and he seeded it June 10th, right? Perfect. How about the treatment? Did it make any difference? Did we get more than 100% emergence? 23. Hey, we got more than 100% emergence. There you go. Man, that apron max works good. Okay. <laughs> Right here, wow. Well, Doug's like, a, well, I guess you're a research small plot grower in Chile. So, Doug does a lot of background work in hybrid canola in Chile and does a lot of small plot work. And so, yeah, he sees that canola seed long before you guys ever plant it. So, of course, you're going to do a better job counting, right? <laughs> Now, there's a lot of variability, and that's just like Murray said, right? There's variability, there's some error. So really, the treatment, no difference, and we wouldn't expect a difference. We got really high quality seed, we planted into ideal conditions, so that's good. Thank you, guys. How about the mechanical damage? So the mechanical damage seed, the germination was only 76%. So there's about 20-some percent abnormals from the mechanical damage. And Holly and Amy can show you a sample of seed. I think they've got some here today. You can see some actually obvious mechanical damage, right, where we peel the, the coat was peeled right off the seed. But there's a lot of times where the mechanical damage is really minor. So there's minor cracks that you can't see, but as soon as we germinate it, you can see it. And to the untrained eye, you'll still think those are good germinated seedlings. But what happens in the field is under ideal conditions like we have here, the seedling starts to emerge and we just glance at it and it looks like we have an excellent plant stand. But as soon as you get the hot, dry, windy conditions like right now, those seedlings are going to pack it in. They don't have a proper root structure. And I don't know if Amy and Holly have some, but let's find out what the counts are first. 13. So, 13. And we were up at 20 here. We're down to 13 already with the mechanical damage. And they might actually be counting some mechanically damaged seedlings that are coming up but are gonna pack it in pretty soon. So it might be a little bit biased. And how'd you do with the treatment? 13. So did the treat... Yeah, so those are ones that are gonna pack it in. So you could see, could you see any that... Okay, yours look good. There's a lot of pea leaf weevil damage, but everybody listened to Hector this morning, and we know not to be too concerned about the pea leaf weevil, right? So we're not worried about that. But we're worried about the mechanical damage and that's a pretty poor stand compared to what we had in the first two counts. The one thing about a seed treatment on mechanically damaged seed, and if you have mechanically damaged seed, maybe not as bad as this, because we only had 76% germ, the seed treatment will help because the mechanical damage or the, the small like cracks in the seed produce more root exudates, and then the pathogens are drawn to the root exudates. That's how they find their host, right? So a pathogen that prefers peas like Pythium is going to be attracted to the root exudates and we get a lot more root exudates from seed that's mechanically damaged. Because we do a test in the lab called EC or electrical conductivity. We use that a lot on canola and also peas. And what it does is it measures the root exudates from the seed as they leach out into the water. And then we use a, an EC meter, right, electrical conductivity meter and it mon or measures the amount of dissolved salts in that water. It's very sensitive and it's rapid overnight. 
So we know right away if there's mechanical damage on that seed. And that's an internationally recognized test that we do through the ISTA, so the International Seed Testing Association. So it's big on peas, big on canola. It's um, actually Sarah Foster who started 2020. She um, did a lot of the pioneering work with Alberta Pulse Growers on EC testing mechanically damaged pea seed to try to help producers limit the amount of mechanical damage. So why, why do they produce more root exudate if they're mechanically damaged? I don't quite understand this reason. Um, it's because the seed coat's damaged. So the seeds, with the seed coat, it's designed to imbibe water at a controlled pace. Okay. So it's really amazing when you look at a seed coat and you talk to a seed physiologist, that whole seed coat is designed to imbibe water at a controlled pace because you've got a dehydrated seed and you don't want to hydrate it really fast. It causes membrane damage, so cells rupture, and when cells rupture, you get leachates. So if you have a broken seed coat or even minor cracks, it imbibes water really fast. And it causes all sorts of problems and that leads to abnormalities and it won't germinate. More mechanically damaged seed, would you see more fusarium root rot type uh, issues in your peas? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that can definitely lead to it. Of course, there's all sorts of other things, right? You could have had some seed borne pathogens, you could have had a history of fusarium in your soil, but it will lead to more issues. So you definitely attract more. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good. Okay. Ken will send you the bill for that, or send me the bill for that. <laughs> Good. Um, did you say you do the EC tests on every seed, or do you have to ask for that as an individual? You have to ask for it. It's a, it's a separate vigor test that we'll do. Um, for some of our canola seed clients, they'll do an EC on every single lot off the combine. Okay, so it depends. I mean, like the canola seed companies have their own system of tests that they do on all their seed all the time so it's it's tested a lot right off the combine right through to after it's treated so some of our clients will do EC on every single lot do it on peas for certain people it just depends but it is something that you can request so Kevin, yes abnormal in pulses I've often seen where you know you've got 10 abnormal 10 percent abnormals and they all and you seed treat and they all grow and then you've got you've got higher than what you were planning population. So you might as well just went with your your germ yeah. and your uh, abnormals combined. That's a perfect question because I brought that up yesterday. About three years ago, everybody in the province had loads of abnormals on their peas because we had such a poor harvest uh, fall or harvest conditions. So we had some cases. A lot of seed was 66% abnormals, and everybody was scratching their head and scrambling for decent seed. So some people had to plant seed that had 66% abs, bump the seeding rate way up, and then it was a perfect spring, right? It was perfect. Just like here, pretty decent conditions, and a lot of those abs actually grew, right? And so, you know, in that case, who can, who can really predict what the spring is going to be? If you had a normal spring, all those abs would pack it in, right? And it depends where you are, right? If you're in Edmonton and we never get these crazy winds and everything, uh, you have those, a lot of those abs will probably grow. If you're growing in Scott, Saskatchewan, where the wind howls and it's bone dry right after you seed, all the abs are going to disappear. And we did this sort of demo in Scott at their field day a few years ago, and the abs, they're just gone. Nothing emerged. So that's a crapshoot there, and I don't know. You have to kind of mitigate that on your farm. Well, and my other question was earth tag on pulses, like peas, can club roots spread because of earth tag on peas? Okay, earth tag on peas, can club root be spread on that? Um, because I'm coming from club root central in Edmonton, um, we're pretty much surrounded by club root fields. And we're talking huge, hugely infested club root fields. So high, high spore numbers. Um, earth tag definitely, definitely can carry the spores, right? Um, the spores, uh, it takes about, what is about 100,000 spores per gram of soil around there until you can possibly see an infection. So lots of spores, but the spores are small and they produce billions of spores in each gall. So I saw barley seed from a grower I know in the Edmonton area, and I don't know what he was doing when he harvested this barley, but he took half the field with it. 
So he took me out to his bin and it's from a known club root infested field. And I took some of that barley and it was just loaded with earth tag. You could put it in a Ziploc bag and sift it and get soil in the bottom. So we took that soil, it was full of club root. So potentially if you planted that barley in a field, um, you, you are introducing spores, right? It takes a lot of club root spores. They've got a lot of natural predators too. So whether or not you're gonna actually introduce the pathogen or actually get a disease symptom showing up on your canola, it's hard to say because you do need a lot to be moved around, but earth egg is a potential source, right? You couldn't deny that. It is a potential, anything that has soil is potential, but how big of a risk? Probably very, very low. The biggest risk is moving lots of soil around, right? Stuck to tires, contractors. We do a lot of club root testing in NISCU for contractors that are moving soil around. So if someone's coming onto your farm and there's a pipeline or something going through your farm, make sure that they are doing their due diligence and testing anything that they're bringing onto your farm, whether it's their equipment that they've cleaned or if they're bringing topsoil to replace something that they've destroyed on your farm. So really important with club root. Does that answer your question about the earth tag? I mean, danced around it a bit, but yeah. That's good, yes. We got the Ag Info Center right here. So, <laughs> are you, st <laughs> you're still there, good. Excellent. So yeah, feel free to correct me, but definitely if you've got seed on there and if it came from an infested place, we detected it, no problem. We do a PCR test for club root. So a molecular test, we were able to detect it, no problem on his barley seed that came from a club root infested field. So, um, if we still have a few minutes, we're not getting kicked out yet. So let's take a look. Amy and Holly have some actual blotters from the lab and they'll tell you um, what's going on there. So just sticking on with the peas, um, I did just pick these out of the field and you can actually see. So this would have been, a, this one has strong, a strong primary root and strong seminal root. So obviously that one is going to grow, it, it will keep growing. Whereas these ones, they, this, this one would have been mechanically damaged. It has no strong primary root and no strong seminal roots to help bring the nutrients up to that plant. So what it needs to keep growing in, into the field here. Um, so I guess if we go into the lab, this is what our pea blotters look like. So when we plant them, we plant 25 seeds on here, roll them up. We do four reps, or 50 seeds, sorry, four reps. So we get 200 seeds. Um, and so this is what we'll see. If you want to move up, we tape them down because yesterday they were all blowing away. But so this is what our high germination good pea seeds will look like. And then here is our mechanical seed. So what Kevin was talking about, how water gets in unevenly and damages the embryo. So I mean, here you can see there's a root but no shoot coming up. Um, this one looks like there's a root and no shoot. So the shoots have been damaged by that water that's being imbibed unevenly. So and even like with these are the seeds, like these ones, they're pretty, um, the cracks are huge on them, but even just a small little crack can cause it to be an abnormal seed. And, and then um, with our pots here, so we, we wanted to show you guys um, the fungal. It actually really, really showed up well. So like our, this is our high germination and high vigor. So definitely everything looks really nice in here. And then our low bigger, there are lots of deads. You'll see lots of deads in there. But all the rest of the seedlings look normal. Same with the fungal infection. So I think Kevin said there's about 70, 75% common root rot on this seed lot, which, I mean, you can see the difference between the treated seed. There's probably about, I don't know how to count it. Looks like maybe close to 100% germination, whereas this one, you can see a lot of dead and the roots are very brown. And, and we also saw that in our plot. Yes. Um, this is our untreated. You can our see seeds. there's already disease that's starting to come up here. They're they're looking like they're weak um, compared to these ones, and definitely a higher germination out of this out of the two that came up. And then this is um, 
I don't know if you, you can talk. About yeah, these are these are what well we don't do a disease here in uh, Lethbridge. They have to be sent to NISCU, but this is what they'll do. So they plate ten seeds and they do two hundred seeds, so there'll be twenty plates of ten seeds. And what they look at, they've got a nice agar base that they grow the seeds on so the bacteria will grow. And what they're looking for is this kind of thing. So the disease analysts can look at all the spores, look at the shape, color, I think they even smell it, the one guy up there told me. <laughs> and they can distinguish what these different uh, bacteria or fungi are. So this one here is probably common root rot. I think one of them here has what looks like it could be fusarium. It shows really pink. I don't know if you saw it on structures, any. yes, and these ones here. So you, on our blotters, like for germination, you can actually see like the pink discoloring here. So obviously there's something there. So we would recommend that you do get a fungal screen just to figure out what exactly you do have on your seed. But as you can tell, like with the treat treatment, it does. There's no no infection that you can see on there. So it looks really healthy. And even just looking at your seeds, like you can't tell if there's anything on it or if it looks like a good vigor or a low vigor or, or if, it, if there's any infection on it. So it is really good to get your seed tested to know what you're starting with. Um, we can do specific tests if you request us to, we can add it on, but no, we'll just test the seed that you bring in. Any other questions? <laughs> What's the red thing in there? The red thing? I don't know what that one would be. That's gotta be something wrong. Fusarium is right? very pink, but I don't know if that's what that would be. Because it looks like there's like a center. You see that? Mm. Oh, it was clear. Yeah, no, it's right to the so, Yeah, I don't know what that is. Yeah, I see what you're looking at. It might have just been part of the the hall. That's what I'm thinking. It must yeah. have been something like so that. So if, if if like for barley, like if it's in in it, then obviously like getting it tested, then you'll you'll be able to tell for sure. Everybody, I'm going to send you guys all the way up to the trailer. You just sit in the shade now for a while. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. And if you have any questions at all, you can get a hold of Holly and Amy and Lethbridge and myself in this gear. You can mail us anything. So thanks again. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you guys very much. That was good. Thank you.